Hello, it's Shudan and Nagar, and today we're going to be solving May June 2022 Paper 1 Variant 3. And before we start, we are currently offering free Topic 1 notes. All you have to do is fill in the form in the description box down below. We are also selling Topic 2 notes, which include all the tips, tricks of Paper 1, and common misconceptions with worked examples too. Upon purchase, you can ask us unlimited number of questions about the topic or past paper questions for free, and you are able to exclusively contact us at any time, which is a new and unique service. Service. We also have another monthly service, which you can ask us unlimited number of questions and past paper questions for the full AS Biology syllabus, only for $12 per month. And if you find this channel useful, I'd highly appreciate it if you would take a moment and subscribe to this channel and like this video. Let's start. Question number one, the diagram shows a section through epithelium found in part of the respiratory system. What is the magnification of the diagram? Now, as we know that the equation for magnification is image size divided by actual size. And we've measured the image size prior and it's 22 millimeters. We've measured this line right here. So, first of all, we have to first convert the image size, 28 millimeters, to micrometers. We do this by multiplying the value by 1000. Then, because it's image size divided by actual size, then it's going to be 28,000 micrometers divided by 80 micrometers, which gives us 350. Question number two, four students were asked to match the function with the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell. Which student correctly matched the numbered functions with the appearance of the cell structure? Now let's start with one, mRNA passes through to the ribosome. As you all know that this structure is definitely going to be the nuclear envelope. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. We have V and X. So V, membranes which surround an enclosed inner cavity. So an enclosed inner cavity is most likely a tubular structure, which is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, not the nuclear envelope, which has pores by the way, to enable the mRNA to pass through. Now let's see X. A double membrane interspersed with pores. So this is correct, a nuclear envelope is a double membrane and it does have pores to allow the movement of substances through. So one is going to be X. Now for two, synthesis of polypeptides. As we all know, polypeptides are synthesized on ribosomes, which are on rough endoplasmic reticulum. So let's see suggestions. Here we have W and Z. So W, non-membrane bound spherical structures. So non-membrane bound and spherical is going to be the ribosome. Therefore, W is correct. Let's see Z. Membrane bound sacs arranged as a flattened stack. So this is going to be the Golgi body. Because as we all know, flattened stacks arranged almost as coins is going to be the Golgi. Now, let's see three, packaging of hydrolytic enzymes that will remain in the cell. So we have a suggestion between Z and W. As we all know that proteins are packaged and modified by Golgi body. And we just said that Z is Golgi body, therefore the answer is going to be C. An experiment was carried out to separate the cell structures in an animal cell. What is the function of the cell structure extracted in pellet one? So, Pellet 1 was poured into a clean centrifuge tube and spun against a higher speed to separate the next heaviest cell structure. The cell structure sank to the bottom, forming pellet 2. Therefore, the heaviest cell structure is going to be what sinks first. Therefore, pellet 1 is going to be the heaviest cell structure. So, coming to our free topic 1 notes, here we have a table with the sizes of cell structures from largest to smallest and as we see here, it's going to be the nucleus, then the chloroplast, then the mitochondria. Therefore, the heaviest structure is going to be the nucleus. And here, the function of the nucleus is definitely going to be the production of mRNA during transcription. Question number four, ATP molecules are synthesized in mitochondria. Which sugar is found in these ATP molecules? Now, let's draw an ATP nucleotide. As we can see here, we have a pentose sugar or a ribose with adenine base. So this is adenine, nitrogenous base. And this is going to be a pentose sugar or more precisely, a ribose sugar. 
then because it's adenine triphosphate is going to be attached to three phosphate three organic phosphates and both the pentose sugar and the adenine base is together called adenosine now let's see the suggestions that we have here a deoxyribose now deoxyribose is incorrect it's the sugar found in dna nucleotides not in atp or mrna nucleotides therefore this is going to be incorrect for b fructose now fructose is definitely incorrect c glucose is also incorrect and d here we have pentose sugar it's going to be correct. It's supposed to be more precisely ribose, but pentose is the only suggestion that we have here, so it's going to be D. Question number five, which row shows a comparison that is not correct between a typical prokaryotic cell and a typical eukaryotic plant cell? Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here for a prokaryotic cell. We have DNA not associated with histones. Now, this is actually correct because in prokaryotic cells, they have a circular DNA. And circular DNA does not have histones. Therefore, this is correct. Eukaryotic plant cell has DNA associated with histones. This is correct. Our normal linear DNA found inside the nucleus is definitely bound to histones. Therefore, this is correct. And here it's asking for the incorrect answer, so A cannot be the answer. B. No endoplasmic reticulum present. Yes. Prokaryotic cells don't have any membrane-bound organelles, therefore this is correct. Now, endoplasmic reticulum present, obviously this is correct, we have both rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth. So this cannot also be the correct answer for C, peptidoglycan cell walls and cellulose cell walls. As we all know, in prokaryotic cells, the cell walls made of peptidoglycan protein and murine, and, and in eukaryotic cells, it is cellulose, so this is also correct and C cannot be correct in this case for D. All ribosomes approximately 18 nanometers in diameter. Here it's talking about the 70S ribosomes or the smaller ribosomes. This is correct because all prokaryotic cells have 70S ribosomes. Now let's move on to eukaryotic plant cells. All ribosomes approximately 22 nanometers in diameter. Now this is partially incorrect because here it's assuming all ribosomes are 22 nanometers, meaning that all ribosomes are 70S. But don't forget that in eukaryotic cells, we both have 80S ribosomes in the cytoplasm and 70S ribosomes both in mitochondria and chloroplasts. Therefore, this is partially incorrect and D is going to be the correct answer in this case. Question number six. It is suggested that primitive prokaryotic cells may be ancestors of certain organelles in eukaryotic cells. Now, this is called the endosymboid theory. And this theory assumes that all eukaryotic cells had prokaryotic origins. Now, which organelle is most similar in composition to a typical prokaryote? Now, the only answer that is correct is going to be the mitochondria. The reason for this is that mitochondria both contains a circular DNA, which is a prokaryotic origin, and 70S ribosomes, which are also a prokaryotic origin. Therefore, C is going to be the correct answer. Question number seven, the concentration of reducing sugar in a solution can be found if an observational measurement is compared to a standard. Which observational measurement could be used to estimate the concentration of reducing sugar in an unknown solution? Now, the test for reducing sugar is using a Benedict solution, a regent, and a positive result would be from blue to brick red. Now, the test for Benedict's solution, or for reducing sugars, is actually a semi-quantitative test. This means that the color of the solution approximately could estimate the concentration of reducing sugar present. By means, as we all know that, let's draw Roy G. Biff. And the color change for Benedict's region starts at blue, and as we go further to red, the reducing sugar concentration keeps increasing. Therefore, green 
to yellow to orange to red this means that the concentration of reducing sugar increases this means that it also could be used to estimate the concentration of reducing sugar depending on the color present now let's see suggestions that we have here one the color of the solution after 20 minutes we just said that the color indicates the concentration therefore this is correct two the time for the first color change to occur this is also correct because the less time the color change occurs, this means the highest reducing sugar concentration. Now for three, the rate of formation of salt particles. Now, in Benedict's test, no salt particles are formed, so this is incorrect and the correct answer must be B. Question number eight, the diagram shows three hexyl sugars, which are correctly shows examples of carbohydrates in which these three hexyl sugars occur. Now let's first identify them. In one, here we have alpha glucose. The reason for this is that we can see the hydroxyl group beneath the glucose ring. Now, for this one, we can see the hydroxyl group above the ring, therefore this is going to be a beta-glucose monomer. N3 is definitely going to also be a beta-fructose monomer. Because a beta-fructose almost looks like a pentagon shape. Now, let's see suggestions that we have here. We have sucrose. Now, as you all know, sucrose is made of alpha glucose and beta fructose. Therefore, three must be present in sucrose. Now, for cellulose, it's made of beta glucose monomers, which is two. And amylopectin is made of alpha glucose monomers. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be D. Question number nine, trehalose is a sugar that gives a negative result when tested with Benedict's solution. So this is a red flag that trehalose is actually a non-reducing sugar. A molecule of trehalose forms two alpha glucose molecules when it is hydrolyzed. Which row is correct? Now, formula of trehalose. First of all, here we have a hint that a molecule of trehalose forms two alpha glucose when it's hydrolyzed. This means that it is a disaccharide. Now, a formula of a disaccharide is alpha glucose formula multiplied by two, subtracting the molecule of water formed in the condensation reaction by means. We know that formula of alpha glucose is C6H12O6. If you multiply this by 2, because it's a disaccharide, we're going to get C12H24O12. Now, in a condensation reaction, we know that a molecule of water is formed. Therefore, we have to subtract two hydrogens and one oxygen from that disaccharide molecule. Therefore, we're going to be left off with C12, H22, and O11. Therefore, this is correct, and sugar that gives the same results with Benedict's as trehalose. Now, we just said that this is a non-reducing sugar, and we know that sucrose is going to be a non-reducing sugar, and the answer is going to be B. Question number 10, Olastra is an artificial lipid. It is made by attaching fatty acids by condensation to a sucrose molecule. A simplified diagram of Olastra is shown. R represents the position where fatty acids would be attached. So here are the examples of places where fatty acids would be attached. Now, humans cannot hydrolyze all estra. However, other animals may be able to do so. How many molecules of water would be needed to hydrolyze one molecule of all estra into fatty acids, fructose, and glucose? Now, let's first see how many, how many molecules of water would be needed to hydrolyze fatty acids. Now, here we could see many fatty acids present, which are shown to represent it by R. Now, therefore, one molecule is going to be needed to break the R here. Same with here, here, here. Therefore, just by the fatty acids, we have that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight water molecules needed for just the fatty acids. Now, here to hydrolyze the fructose and glucose. Now we need one water molecule in order to break the glycosidic bond between the fructose and glucose. Therefore, in total, we have now nine water molecules. And the answer is going to be C. 
Question number 11, which molecule contains at least one peptide bond? Now let's first draw a peptide bond so you guys could be familiar with it. So, with the carboxyl group, so this is what a peptide bond looks like. Now, as we can see here, that all the bonds occurring here are glycosidic bonds, apart from B, where here we could see peptide bonds, two peptide bonds present. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. Question number 12. RNA polymerase and peptidyl transferase are both enzymes involved in protein synthesis. Which statements describe similarities between these two enzymes? Now, RNA polymerase is the enzyme used to synthesize mRNA molecules. And peptidyl transferase, so to synthesize mRNA during transcription. Now, peptidyl transferase is used during translation where it actually synthesizes the peptide bond between the amino acids carried by the tRNA molecule. So, amino acids carried by tRNA molecules during translation. Now, one, they are both globular proteins. Yes, because they are both enzymes and enzymes are globular proteins, so this is going to be correct. Two, they both have the same tertiary structure. Now, as you just said that they have different substrates, therefore it, it, this means that they are specific for different substrates, therefore they can never have the same tertiary structure shape, therefore this is incorrect. Three, they are both intracellular enzymes, this is also correct by RNA polymerase synthesizes mRNA in the nucleus and peptidyl transferase in the cytoplasm, so they are both inside the cell, so 1 and 3 is going to be correct and the answer is going to be B. Question number 13, what is a feature of competitive enzyme inhibition? So competitive inhibitors bind to the active site of the enzyme, preventing substrate molecules binding. Therefore, this lowers the affinity for the enzyme for the substrate and also increases the KM because affinity decreases. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. A, the inhibitor binds permanently to the active site. It does not bind permanently. Actually, competitive inhibition is a reversible reaction. B, inhibition can be reversed by increasing the concentration of the substrate. Now, this is correct. The reason for this is if we increase the concentration of the substrate, this outweighs the effect of the competitive inhibitor. So this is correct C. The inhibitor molecule changes the secondary structure of the enzyme. Okay, first of all, the inhibitor or a competitive inhibitor does not change the secondary structure or any structure at all. So this is incorrect. It's the non-competitive inhibitor which alters the tertiary structure. That's all. D. The substrate and the inhibitor are the same shape. Not necessarily, because there is something called induced fit hypothesis. This means that a substrate with a shape not necessarily too complementary to the tertiary structure could still bind to the enzyme and induce the enzyme to bind or mold around the substrate. Therefore, this is incorrect and it's not necessarily correct. Therefore, the answer is going to be B. Question number 14. Batrachotoxin is a poison found in frogs in the Colombian jungle. The poison is used to produce poison darts. The poison works by increasing the permeability of the cell surface membrane of nerve and muscle cells to sodium ions, which move out of the cells. Four students made statements about the, how the poison affects these cells. Which statements are correct for these cells affected by batrachotoxin? Now, here it says that the sodium ions move out of cells. This means that the extracellular fluid has now a lower water potential and a higher solute concentration. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. 1. Water leaves the cells by osmosis, causing the cells to shrink. This is correct, because as we all know in osmosis, water moves down water potential gradient. And because we said that the extracellular fluid of cells now has a lower water potential because sodium ions have moved out, and now it has a higher concentration of sodium ions, this means that the cell is now going to have a higher water potential. 
because of the increased sodium ions. Therefore, what's going to happen is that water would leave the cell to the extracellular fluid where there is a lower water potential. Therefore, this is correct. For two, water enters the cell by osmosis causing the cell to burst. Now, this is incorrect because of what we just mentioned. Three, when the sodium ions move out of the cells, the intracellular fluid has a more positive water potential than the extracellular. So, a more positive water potential means a higher water potential. Now, as we all know, when sodium ions move out of cells, the water potential inside the cell increases and the water potential of the extracellular fluid actually decreases due to the increased sodium concentration outside. Therefore, 3 is correct. And 4, when the sodium ions move out of the cells, the extracellular fluid has a more positive water potential. No, this is incorrect. It would have a more negative water potential. Therefore, the correct answer must be A. Question number 15, which processes use energy in the form of ATP? Now here we have endocytosis and exocytosis. Both of these are correct because the movement of vesicles in and out of the cells do require ATP. 3. Facilitated diffusion. So this is incorrect, it's a passive process and it does not require ATP. So facilitated diffusion is the movement of molecules down concentration gradient but through transport proteins. And it does not require ATP. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be B. Question number 16. An indicator is colorless in acid and pink in alkali. So pink in alkali and colorless in acid. In an experiment, a petri dish of agar was prepared using an acidic solution of this indicator. So it started off as colorless. A disc of agar 1 cm in diameter was removed from the center to create a well. A white card showing circular marker lines one centimeter apart was placed underneath the petri dish. One centimeter cubed alkali solution was put into the well in the agar and a stopwatch was started. Therefore, it would turn from colorless now to pink. A circular disc of pink color appeared and spread through the agar. It reached the first marker in line in a short time but took longer to reach the second marker line and a very long time to reach the third marker line. And the alkali moves through the disc by diffusion. By simple diffusion. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. Facilitate the diffusion of alkali solution. Yes, alkali solution is what diffuses because the color changed to pink. And facilitated diffusion is incorrect as we said because here transport proteins are not present. It's just a normal simple diffusion. Therefore, facilitated is incorrect and alkali is correct. Now, simple diffusion. This is correct as we just said. And diffusion of the indicator. This is incorrect because indicator is not the substance that actually diffuses. What diffuses is going to be the alkali because that was the solution that it was put into. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be C. Question number 17. The diagram shows a section of a glycoprotein molecule found embedded in a cell surface membrane. Each of the amino acids is represented by a small shaded circle. Which row shows a property of the amino acids found in alpha helix and a property of amino acid Q? Now, amino acids found in alpha helix is at the hydrophobic core, which is made of fatty acids. Now, the substance found in the hydrophobic core is also going to be hydrophobic or nonpolar. Therefore, this alpha helix part is definitely going to be nonpolar. And we see here that the amino acid Q is found at the outside or the phosphate part of the membrane. And this part is actually hydrophilic or polar. And this enables it to form hydrogen bonds with the extracellular fluid or the intracellular fluid. Now, the amino acid that's going to be found at this part of the membrane is definitely also going to be hydrophilic or polar. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be A. 
Question number 18, some cells are listed. Which cells can divide by mitosis? One, bacterial cells. Now this is incorrect. The reason for this is that bacterial cells actually divide by binary fission, not mitosis. Be careful of the terminology here. Two, cancer cells. Yes, cancer cells actually divide by uncontrolled mitosis, so this is correct. Three, lymphocytes. Yes, when an antigen enters the body, B and T lymphocytes are actually stimulated to divide by mitosis, so this is correct for mature red blood cells. This is incorrect. Red blood cells do not divide. Why you would ask is because it does not even have a nucleus to enable it to divide. Therefore, this is incorrect. Five stem cells, they do divide by mitosis, forming one stem cell and a cell which can differentiate into any type of cell. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be 2, 3, and 5, which is C. Question number 19, which statements about mitosis are correct? 1. At the end of telophase, two nuclei are formed. Now, this is actually correct because as you see here, the two sister chromatids have moved to the opposite sides of the cell. So here we have a chromatid and we, here we have also a chromatid. Then at telophase, a nuclei forms around those sister chromatids at the opposite poles. Therefore, this is correct. To centrals attach chromosomes to the spindle during metaphase. Now, this is incorrect. It's not centrals. Here, we have a chromosome made of two sister chromatids and made of a centromere. Therefore, the centromere is what attaches the chromosomes to the spindle. Or to be more precise, it attaches to the kinetochore found inside the centromere. Therefore, this is incorrect for three. Chromatids are pulled apart during anaphase. Now, during anaphase, as you just said, the spindle attaches to the kinetochore, pulling the two sister chromatids apart to the opposite sides of the cell. In opposite directions, therefore, this is correct. And the answer is going to be C. Question number 20, which statement about telomeres is correct? Now, the definition of telomeres are bases of non-coding DNA found at the ends of chromatids. At the ends of chromatids. And these bases of non-coding DNA protect the chromosome from gene shortening during DNA replication. Therefore, let's see the suggestions that we have here. A. They allow cells in culture from any age of donor to divide a fixed number of times. So here, because it said from any age, this is correct, because obviously, as the person's age increases, the telomere's size actually decreases. And if the telomeres decrease, this means that the, they are not able to divide a fixed number of times. They actually divide less number of times. Therefore, this is incorrect. B. There are genes which are present on the 5' prime end of every chromosome. This is not correct. It's not just present at the 5' prime end. It's also 5 and 3'. Prime. There are unpaired regions of DNA on the 3' prime end of every chromosome. As we just mentioned, this is also incorrect. D. They're, they prevent introns and exons being lost from genes during cell division. Now, exons and introns, we're going to discuss them in the next few questions. But here, in general, it says it prevents genes being lost during cell division. This is correct. As we said, it protects the chromosome from gene loss and gene shortening. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be D. Question number 21. The diagram shows stages of mitosis. What is the correct sequence of stages of mitosis numbered on the diagram? So let's start with one. One here appears as almost late prophase. Here, because we could see condensed chromosomes that are far apart from each other. Now, for two, here we could see almost early telophase or late anaphase. The reason for this is that we could see that the two sister chromatids are separated to the opposite sides of the cell. Now, for three, it's even an earlier part of prophase, this could be early prophase. Because here, the chromosomes are closer together or the chromatids are actually close, closer together and they look less condensed. Therefore, this is early prophase and this looks like late prophase. Now for four, 
this looks at an even later stage of prophase because here we could see that the chromatids are lining parallel to each other so this is could be early metaphase or very late prophase now for five this almost looks as early anaphase because here chromatids are seen almost halfway through the cell but in two they are seen at the far ends of the opposite sides now let's see the suggestions that we have here so we're first going to start with three because we said it's the earliest form of anaphase we could see in these cells now the second one is definitely also going to be one then it's going to be four not the opposite because we as we just said that four looks like it's going to be early metaphase so this is the latest stage of prophase now let's see here then we have five because we just said it's early anaphase then we have two so five and two because we just said it's going to be early telophase or late anaphase and we explained the reasons why therefore the answer is going to be c Question number 22, which statement about the transcription and translation of a gene is correct? A, the non-transcribed strand of DNA has a base sequence that is identical to mRNA. So both of these are incorrect. The reason for this is that DNA doesn't have uracil and mRNA has uracil. So it's impossible that they are both identical. So both of these are incorrect. For C and D. Firstly, the non-transcribed strand of DNA has a base sequence that is complementary to the tRNA molecules required in translation. Now, let's take a closer look at this diagram so you further understand my statement. Now, here, this is the non-transcribed strand and this is the transcribed strand. And this is the RNA. Now, I'm going to write the tRNA code that is complementary to this RNA so we could solve the question. So, it's going to be T, A, C, T, A, and the list goes on. Here, it says that the non-transcribed strand is complementary to the tRNA. Therefore, this is correct because adenine goes with thymine, thymine goes with adenine, and G goes with C, and A goes with T. Therefore, C is going to be the correct answer. Now, here it's assuming that for D, that the transcribed strand, this one, is going to be complementary to the tRNA. Now, this is incorrect. As you can see, they are not complementary. They are almost identical. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be C. Question number 23, which statement about mRNA is correct? A, the primary transcript becomes modified by joining of introns to become mRNA. Now, the primary transcript is the original mRNA strand formed right after translation. So it's the original one without any modification. Now, here it says modified by the joining of introns to become mRNA. This is incorrect. It's modified by the joining of exons. Now, let's explain further. So, the primary transcript is modified by an enzyme called spliceosome. This spliceosome removes the introns and joins together the exons. So, these are made of exons by a process called alternative splicing. So to help you remember, introns remain inside the cell, so introns are non-coding parts and they remain inside the nucleus, sorry, and exons exits the nucleus. That's an easy way to remember it. Now the exons join together at different orders, modifying the mRNA. For B, the primary transcript is synthesized and then modified to mRNA in the nucleus. Now, this is correct. We just said that the process of alternative splicing happens inside the nucleus before the modified mRNA leaves through the nuclear pores. See, mRNA contains nucleotides containing the sugar deoxyribose. 
Now, as we said, that RNA nucleotides contain ribose sugar, not deoxyribose. Deoxyribose is found in DNA nucleotides. D. The bases in mRNA are held together by covalent bonds. Now, as we know, that nitrogenous bases are held together by hydrogen bonds, not covalent. Therefore, the correct answer must be B. Question number 24. The diagram shows part of a DNA molecule. Which label is correct? Now, here we have two hints. As you all know, the double ring st structures are purines, and purines are adenine and guanine. And the single ring structures here, we can see, are pyrimidines. And pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine. And the other hint we have is the number of hydrogen bonds present between them. So, adenine binds with thymine via two hydrogen bonds, and cytosine binds with guanine via three hydrogen bonds. Therefore, now it's easy for us to identify which one is supposed to be adenine, thymine, or cytosine, or guanine. Now for C, it must be adenine, because here we can see two hydrogen bonds and adenine is a purine with a double ring structure and this must be thymine and B must be C and A must be G. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be D. For 25, the sequence of bases in DNA coding for the first eight amino acids in the beta polypeptide of adult hemoglobin is the following. Which change occurs to the amino acid sequence of normal hemoglobin to make it hemoglobin C? Now, as you can see here, the base that actually changed is CTC to TTC. CTC is glutamic acid, or GLU, and TTC is lysine. So the change happened from glutamic acid to lysine, therefore A is going to be the correct answer. Question number 26, the diagram shows a plant organ which letter correctly labels the xylem. So this is a cross section through a stem and this is where a vascular bundle is present in the stem. Within that vascular bundle we know that the area to the outside or B is going to be the phloem. So the area to the outside is always going to be the phloem, and the area separating the phloem and the xylem is going to be the cambium, and therefore area D is going to be the xylem, area to the inside. Therefore the correct answer is going to be D. Question number 27. The photomicrograph shows a vascular bundle found in a plant organ. Which statement about this vascular bundle are correct? 1. The vascular bundle is part of the structure of a root. Now, this is incorrect. The reason for this is that it looks like a structure of a vascular bundle found in a stem. Because it looks something like this. With this area here being the phloem. This area X, the cambium and area Y being the xylem and the sclerenchyma. 2. Some of the cells in region X have very large numbers of mitochondria. It might actually have in some regions. The reason for this is because we said that the phloem is present right here. And companion cells found beside the phloem sift tube elements contain large numbers of mitochondria to be able to load the sucrose into the phloem sift tube elements. Therefore, this is, might be correct. 3. Region Y is made up of a number of different cell types. So as you just said, that region Y contains the xylem because we can see that the larger circles, this is going to be the xylem. And beside the xylem, we can see many smaller cells which are most likely the sclerenchyma. Therefore, this is correct, and the answer is going to be C. 
Question number 28, which changes to the water potential in the volume of solution in the phloem sift tube element occur when sucrose is moved from the phloem sift tube element to an actively dividing shoe tip? So here we're looking at the process of unloading of sucrose. Now let's take a closer look at the unloading of sucrose. This is the sink cells. What happens is that sucrose in the phloem sift tube elements moved down by hydrostatic pressure moves into the sink cells by diffusion followed by some water too therefore what happens is that the water potential in the flow and sift tube element becomes higher the reason for this is because we just said that the sucrose moves from the flow and sift tube elements into the sink cells so this is going to be correct and then the volume of solution in the flow and sift tube element because sucrose is moved into sink cells it is also moved by some water therefore the volume of solution also decreases therefore the answer is going to be a question number 29 which processes occur during the loading of sucrose into phloem sift tubes now let's quickly outline the process of loading of sucrose so last question was unloading now here we're doing the loading of sucrose now Let's start with the companion cell and the phloem sift tube elements. What happens is that the companion cell starts off by pumping hydrogen ions by proton pumps outside to its cell wall. So this is the companion cell. And it pumps hydrogen ions to its cell wall by proton pumps. And this is an active process that requires ATP. Then what happens that sucrose synthesized by adjacent mesophyll cells is also present at the outside then both the hydrogen ions and the sucrose go back into the companion cell through something called a co-transporter protein at the cell surface membrane. Therefore, once the sucrose is present inside the cytoplasm of the companion cell, it moves through the plasmodesmata of the companion cell into the phloem sift tube elements down the fusion gradient. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. One, protons are pumped out of the cytoplasm. We just said that it is correct. Two, there is a higher concentration of protons in the symplastic pathway outside the companion cell. This is correct. There is a higher concentration of protons outside, but symplastic pathway is incorrect. It's supposed to be apoplastic pathway. Because apoplastic pathway is the movement of water in the intracellular spaces through cell walls. But the symplastic pathway is the movement of water through the cell walls itself or through the cell itself. Therefore, this is going to be incorrect. Three protons are enabled to move back into the companion cell. This is incorrect. We just said that both. The hydrogen ions in the sucrose move back into the companion cell through a co-transporter protein, so this is incorrect. For a co-transporter molecule acts as a carrier for protons and sucrose, you just said this is correct, and the answer is going to be B. Question number 30. The photomicrograph shows a section through a structure found in mammals viewed using a light microscope. What is the main components of layer W? So, this looks like an artery because it has a circular looking lumen and a very thick tunica intima, media and externa. So let's start with the labeled layers of the artery. Now the very inner layer is tunica intima and the middle layer is tunica media and the outer layer is tunica externa. So it's made of three layers. Now the tunica intima is made of epithelial cells. And the tunica media is made of both, of all three of collagen, elastic fibers, and smooth muscles. So an acronym to remember it is CES. So collagen, elastic fibers, and smooth muscles. However, in the tunica media, the main components present are actually elastic fibers and smooth muscles. But in the tunica externa, the main component is actually collagen. So don't be confused. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. A. Collagen fibers only. This is incorrect. B. Elastic fibers and collagen fibers. We just said that collagen is not really a main component of the tunica media, which is layer W. 
so this is incorrect see smooth muscle and elastic fibers yes these are the main components the squamous epithelial cells forming an endothelium this is incorrect and the answer is going to be c question number 31 which statement correctly links muscular or elastic arteries to their function a. The aorta is an example of a muscular artery as it transports blood from the left ventricle of the heart. Now, here's asking for the correct statement to explain the function, not an example. And anyways, this example is incorrect because the aorta, because it transports blood at the first part, is going to be an actual elastic artery not a muscular artery muscular artery is at the second part of transportation b arteries further away from the heart are muscular arteries as they transport blood at higher pressure it still does not explain the function elastic arteries expand when the heart contracts and then recoil as the heart relaxes to maintain pressure yes this is the function of elastic arteries or elastic fibers that they expand and then recoil so maintaining the pressure not too high and not too low so this is correct D muscular arteries facilitate smoother blood flow than elastic arteries as their walls expand and recoil so first of all this is incorrect muscular arteries don't expand and recoil muscular arteries contract and relax be careful of the terminology it's the elastic fibers that expands and recoil but muscular contracts and relaxes so the answer is going to be c question number 32 the graph shows the changes in pressure that occur in the left side of the heart during one cardiac cycle what is the heart rate in beats per minute so as we could see here a full contraction or heartbeat takes 0 0.8 seconds and here's asking how many per minute so what do we do is that the minute has 60 seconds so 60 divided by 0 0.8 gives us 75 beats per minute so the answer is going to be a question number 33 which events occur during ventricular systole so ventricular systole is the phase where the ventricle contracts pushing blood through the semilunar valve and into the aorta or the pulmonary artery now let's see suggestions that we have here one atrioventricular valves close this is correct because atrioventricular valves are actually between the ventricles and the atrium and when the ventricle contracts so to avoid blood flow back into the atrium what happens is that, is that the atrioventricular valves close to avoid black backflow of blood for two muscle in ventricle wall relaxes this is incorrect we just said it contracts three semilunar valves open this is correct because when the ventricles contracts it generates enough pressure to push the semilunar valves open therefore this is correct and the answer is going to be c number 34 which reactions take place in a capillary in the lungs one carbonic acid is formed from carbon dioxide and water so this is incorrect because if carbonic acid is going to be formed this means that there is now a higher concentration of carbon dioxide and this does not take place in the lungs this takes place in muscle tissue so this is incorrect two carbaminohemoglobin is formed from carbon dioxide and hemoglobin this also means that there's a higher concentration of carbon dioxide this is incorrect this happens in muscle tissue not in the lungs three Hemoglobinic acid is formed from hemoglobin and hydrogen ions. Also, here it's assuming that there's an increased concentration of carbon dioxide. This also happens in muscle, not in the lungs. 4. Carbon dioxide and water are formed from hydrogen carbonate ions and hydrogen ions. This is correct. Carbon dioxide and water are actually formed so carbon dioxide is able to be excreted by the lungs. So, for is the only correct answer, therefore the answer is going to be D. Question number 35, which features are important for the process of diffusion of oxygen out of an alveolus? 1. Blood pressure forces red blood cells through capillaries. This is correct because as more red blood cell enters the capillaries, this means that there is a higher oxygen concentration diffusing because oxygen binds to hemoglobin which is inside red blood cells. So this is correct. 2. Epithelium is permeable to respiratory gases. Obviously, this facilitates the diffusion of oxygen. 3. Moist squamous epithelium present. Yes, the moist squamous epithelium helps the oxygen gas to dissolve in that moist fluid. 
therefore also facilitating its diffusion, so this is correct for substance to reduce surface tension. Now, the substance is called pulmonary surfactant. And this has nothing to do with the diffusion of oxygen. Pulmonary surfactant prevents the alveoli collapsing by the surface tension. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 36. A student viewed three slides at both low magnification and high magnification. Each slide was sectioned through a different airway of the gas exchange system. The student observed three features in each slide, which row correctly identifies the three slides. 1. Irregular arrangement of cartilage, highly folded inner layers, cilia and epithelial cells. So irregular arrangement of cartilage is going to be the irregular blocks. This means that it's definitely going to be the bronchus. Only two components in the gas exchange system have cartilage. It's the trachea and the bronchus, but the trachea has C-shaped cartilage, not irregular. Therefore, this must be the bronchus. Two, very few goblet cells, cilia and epithelial cells, and a thick layer of smooth muscle relative to wall thickness. So, a component that has a very few Goblet cells is definitely going to be the bronchiole. Therefore, one is going to be the bronchus and two is going to be the bronchiole. Three, smooth muscle tissue, blood vessels, and many goblet cells. So many goblet cells here. There's no other information. Therefore, it must be the trachea. And the answer is going to be A. 37. Which terms can be used to describe the role of mosquitoes in the transmission of malaria? So, mosquito is the insect vector carrying the plasmodium or the malaria pathogen. So, let's see the suggestions that we have here. 1. Malarial parasite. No, it's not the parasite. The parasite is plasmodium, not the mosquitoes. It's the vector. 2. Pathogen. This is also incorrect. The pathogen is going to be the plasmodium. 3. Vector. We just said it's the vector, so this is going to be correct and the answer is going to be D. Question number 38. Rheumatoid arthritis is a disease which causes the body's immune system to attack its own cells. The disease can be treated using monoclonal antibodies. The table shows how five different monoclonal antibodies can work. Inflammation and swelling of joints are symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. So inflammation and swelling, the cytokine TNF-alpha activates cells in the immune system, leading to death of cells in the joints. So cytokines released by T lymphocytes is what activates the cell in the immune system, leading to the death of the joint. So it's the immune system that destroys the joint, and this is caused by cytokines from T lymphocytes. Which type of monoclonal antibody could be used to treat rheumatoid arthritis? Now let's see suggestions that we have here. One, binding to proteins on cell surfaces and triggering the immune system. As we said, it's the immune system that's destroying the joints, and we actually want to stop the immune system attacking these joints. Therefore, this is incorrect. We don't want to trigger the immune system, we want to stop it or halt it. 2. Blocking molecules on cell surfaces that inhibit C lymphocytes. Actually, it's this is incorrect because you want to activate the molecules that inhibit T lymphocytes, not block. You want to activate it. The reason for this is because we just said that it's the T lymphocytes that releases the cytokines. And if you stop the production of T lymphocytes, this means that the cytokines is going to decrease. This means that the immune system is going to be stimulated less. And that's what we want. So this is incorrect. 3. Blocking cell signaling receptors that trigger cell division. So this is absolutely indirect. So this is incorrect because if you're going to uh, block the receptors that trigger cell division, this means that cell division is going to be halted for the whole body. And we don't want this. Therefore, this is incorrect. 4. Binding to antigens on cell surfaces and releasing a drug. Now, here we said that the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis is going to be inflammation and swelling and binding to antigens on the cell surface receptors of the joints and releasing some sort of a drug could help with the symptoms. Therefore, this is correct. 5. Blocking cell signaling receptors that trigger the immune system. This is totally correct because we just said that the immune system is what's destroying the cells. And if you block the cell signaling receptors that trigger that immune system, then 
the death of the cells attacked by immune system is going to stop. Therefore, 4 and 5 is going to be correct and the answer is going to be D. Question number 39. A person's blood group is determined by antigens present on the red blood cells. Antibodies in the plasma of the person who receives the blood can make some blood transfusions unsafe. The table shows the antigens and antibodies in the blood of people with different blood groups. Which blood groups can be given to a person with blood group A? So, here in other words is saying that the person receiving the blood does not contain antibodies to the donor's blood. So, the person receiving, which is A, does not contain antibodies to the donor's blood. So here, we could see that A has anti-B antibodies on them. Therefore, here we just said that it shouldn't contain antibodies to the donor's blood. Therefore, B, anything that contains B, is unable to donate to A. Therefore, the blood groups that could be given to A is anything other than B, which is A and O, and the answer is going to be B. Question number 40. Some of the events during the primary immune response are listed. What is the correct sequence of events during the primary immune response? Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. We are definitely going to start with one. Because one, here it says the phagocytosis of a foreign microbe by a macrophage and antigen presentation. So, an antigen stimulates macrophage to engulf it by phagocytosis. And then what happens is that macrophage now represents, represents the antigens by a process called antigen presentation. And the macrophage becomes an antigen presenting cell, showing the antigens to the rest of the immune system. So what is going to be correct? Now what happens is that B cells and T cells with complementary B cell and T cell receptors to that antigen are stimulated. For example, now the B cells with complementary B cell receptor to that antigen are stimulated to divide by mitosis. So the B cell dividing, which are complementary to it, dividing into plasma cells, secreting antibodies and memory cells. And now the T cells with complementary T cell receptors to this antigen that was presented by the antigen presenting cell also stimulated to divide by mitosis to T helper cells and T killer cells. Therefore, four is going to be correct. A T helper cell with a complementary receptor binds to the antigens being present. Now what happens is that the T helper cell divides by mitosis, we just said that, so 3 is also going to be correct for the third step. And then what happens is that the T lymphocytes will become T killer cells which kill infected body cells. We just said that the T killer cells are also formed by the division of T lymphocytes. And T killer cells kill body cells by secreting perforin, which penetrates holes in them in the infected cells. Therefore, B is going to be the correct answer. If you find this channel useful and this video useful, I'd highly appreciate it if you would take a moment and subscribe to this channel and like this video.